Who has um, friends up north, uh, family up north? Anyone? <laughs> Isn't it fun to be? <laughs> Doesn't it just give you the edge when you have people up there? You know they don't have anything on you. And I called my sister, it was nine. It's just nine degrees, nine, one, one number. <laughs> and I said, pray for me, pray for me. Um, Dale's name's Dale, pray for me, it's, it's, it's 60. <laughs> I got a sweater on, oh, I know, it's hard. And then, anyway, it was, it was just, just gives me the, I'm the youngest, so anytime I get an advantage, it's best um, for me. Revelation chapter six, we're gonna continue our series on Revelation. and. And um, this is when it starts to get a little bit um, difficult and sometimes a little spicy. And, um, and, and trying to bring this, not only teach you what's being taught here, the panoramic view of Revelation. And I want to back up. It, please know to teach this book effectively um, and, and to tie it into potential current events would take a lot more than just the weeks that we're spending on it. You would have to break down every chapter, especially the chapters that we're going through now, and, and really do a lot of, you, you would take you probably four or five weeks just to get through chapter six. We're doing a chapter a week, or trying to do a chapter a week. So what we're trying to do is just give you a panoramic, panoramic flowing view of the book of Revelation. Now, some of, I have numerous resources and commentaries I use, almost about 20, that I use to reference in the study for this work. And some of the things, notions I had going into this, I would get my favorite con commentaries, the ones, the people I respect and the guys I like the best, and they would disagree with what I was thinking. And then some of my least favorite, they would agree. And um, I've learned after going through this that there isn't a lot of agreement. I mean, there's, there's, I found eight person to have this view and five people have this view and 12 person to have that view. And then one person said they counted 50 different views of one verse. <laughs> so, what I'm giving you today is the Kelly version, and, and um, take it for what it's worth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do, it's going to be, I can find holes in my own version here. I can, so, please know, if I'm finding the holes in my own version, there's holes in every version. I'm saying all that to say we just don't know exactly what is being said here. But I'm going to show you the best I can and, um, and bring this out. And again, um, we are going to go basically consensus here, or if something I feel it wasn't consensus is really a conviction I have, I'll, I'll use that. Let me read you a few quotes. First, I don't have for the screen. The second, I do. This is one commentary and as a prelude into Revelation chapter 6. The dramatic moment has arrived. God's book, the book of destiny, the great book of history, the book that spells out what is, what is to happen in the end time, is now open. That's talking about Revelation chapter 6. And another commentary said this, starts the same way. The dramatic moment has come now. The seals that now bind God's book are, not, are now to be broken. One by one they shall be broken. Amazingly, as the seals are broken, an amazing thing happens. What is written under the seals of the book leaps off its pages and acts out the events of the future for John and the heavenly host. They actually see what appears to be a picture or a movie of the end time. This is important to note, for John and the heavenly host are not reading the book, they are witnessing the events of the end time, the end of human history. And so we're going to cover the whole chapter here as we'll try to do. Some of it will go quickly, some will slow down on a little bit. But in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, it says this, first two verses. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. Now we've gone over the creatures before in the previous chapters. And I looked and behold a white horse. And its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So we'll stop right there. So the first, the lamb, Jesus, opens the first of the seven seals in the scroll, and, and, and they see a white horse. Behold, a white horse that had a bow, a bow and arrow, and a crown was given to him. Now, this is probably one of the most highly debated um, portions in, in the book of Revelation. For those who have a historical interpretation, 
of this, which means they think this corresponds to a point in time in the past uh, in church history. There are like 50 different views <laughs> for that. So I have a more of a futuristic view. I believe this is looking forward, not backwards. Um, we said that at the very beginning, that that would be our approach. We're going to look have a futuristic approach in, of interpreting this. Some will say the first writer is Christ, Jesus. And they have a good reason to say that. He's got the white robe. He's got the crown. He's got, he's got a lot of different things going on. Um, I'm going to say that he's just the opposite of the Christ. He's the Antichrist. I would say that that view has more um, people behind it than just me. And he's the Antichrist. Numerous reasons why we believe that. He wears white um, to, to be like Christ as a means of deception. We know that he's an angel of light, and he's a, he's a deceiver. So, and the Antichrist is just that. He's an anti-type of Christ. He tries to mimic Christ. Number two, the crown that, the, that this rider of the horse wears um, in, is different than the one Christ wears in Revelation chapter 19. This, this rider of the horse wears a crown that's a Stephanus crown. That's a crown of, like, of the bema seat. It's a crown of conquering or a crown of winning. That's a different type of crown. The crown that we see on Christ in Revelation 19 is a diadema crown. That's a crown of royalty, of kingship. That's something the king is given. Two different crowns, two different reasons. One is a picture of kingship. One is a picture of victory and conquering. Again, what will the Antichrist do? He wants to come and to conquer and, and replace Christ and, and, and to annihilate God's people on earth. The bow symbolizes um, conquest, usually in the scriptures. Again, ver different verses for that. Psalm 46, verse 9, Jeremiah 51, 51. I won't give you all the verses. And we know that Satan uses what in Revelation, I'm sorry, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Fiery darts. He shoots arrows. He shoots darts. So the bow symbolizes conquest. And lastly, as we go through the rest of these riders, riders of these hor next three horses after this, you'll find out that the Antichrist interpretation definitely flows better with the rest of these characters. <laughs> because Jesus would be out of place here when, he, when you so look at the rest of the riders of this book. So thus the rider, the Antichrist, we believe, who comes on the scene Shortly after the rapture of the church, we believe, or shortly before, depending on different people's views, he assumes, he assumes power on the earth um, through deception, and he uses the 2 Corinthians 11, 14 approach, which is the angel of light approach. That he, he comes masqueraded as Christ. He comes masqueraded as something good, but he's evil. That is the most effective tool, by the way, the devil has is the angel of light approach, ministers of righteousness. If you ever want to find a deceptive, um, a, a great deception, let people be convinced that they're doing it in Jesus' name when they're really operating in a different kingdom altogether. That's no greater deception than that because then they have all their own um, convictions and righteousness behind them when indeed it's demo uh, de demonical. It's, um, how sorry, de it's bad. <laughs> and um, <laughs> there it goes. If you can't find another word, just make one, just use a simple one, that's all. <laughs> and, um, and, and this is, um, and by this angel of light approaches, approach, he, he deceives the masses. And then he wages war on all those that hold on to truth that do not fall under his spell. Now, this is no doubt the absolute. It could be, I should say, the absolute chaos caused by the removal of the church, Revelation chapter 4. You imagine the rapture of the church, and, and everyone, all the Christians that are truly born again and sealed with the Spirit, disappear from the earth just like that. It may cause a few eyebrows to go up. It may cause some plane crashes, car wrecks, governments to fail. Um, who God knows the chaos if, if all of a sudden... Uh, a billion people or more disappeared from the planet Earth. What would happen here? The world, the world would be thrown into such amazing chaos and such amazing confusion that it's a perfect opportunity for this um, antichrist, this, this, in, this 
opposite of Jesus, this evil satanic man, to be raised up within society and say, hey, I'm here, I have an answer, we have to band together in unity if we're going to beat this awful thing that's happened to planet Earth. I'm here to help you. We need to unify at all times. Now nations can disappear and all the differences that we've had and all the armament can disappear and we can be a one family on planet Earth. We're just planet Earth. We're just a human race all on the same team finally after all these years. Sounds great, doesn't it? If I was here, I may vote for that myself. But I'm planning on hanging on to Andre and go, going up in the rapture. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bite, bite right to his belt. It's going to right up there. That's, that'll be me trying to weigh you down, but I'm going up with you. <laughs> now, it's interesting because this one world entity, they love rejecting. Um, when you find a common enemy, I've watched this and you've seen it too. When you find two people that may be enemies, but then, then they find a common enemy, all of a sudden, those two enemies have this brand new relationship. It's a common hatred, or it's a common resentment, or it's a common something against somebody else. And now that relationship will be short-lived, don't get me wrong, because that's no foundation for any relationship. I've seen in the marriages, the husband and the wife aren't getting along too well, but then they'll find someone that hurts both of them, so they'll have this little revival, the marital revival, enough to get, um, to spew their venom towards this one other target, but that's not true unity. That's not real healing. That's just make believe, and that true will fall. That too will fall short. And that's sort of what the the, the antichrist likes to do. I believe in the tribulation period is he likes to create an enemy for people that really isn't their enemy at all. And that enemy will be the people of God, those left behind on the rapture. Verse three of chapter six. We got a long way to go here. Wow. I'll have you here to 9.30. Now I'll get you out there by 10. And when, when, he, when he opens the second seal, I heard, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And he came out, of, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so the people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. So the next rider is a red horse. Red always represents blood and war. And this rider in heaven, he's a rider in heaven, but his, his life, his um, ministry, if I can use that term, is played out amongst us here on planet Earth, for those who are here. And just as this last rider was the Antichrist, this rider might also be the Antichrist. Some think it's just another version of him, or some think it's at least a representation of his government. We don't really know exactly who this rider is. But to understand that this writer was p permitted to take peace from the earth. Just as the, this is likely, if I could say, before the great tribulation period. Likely. Likely. It's, um, as some would call, the beginning of sorrows. And usually some will feel right in the midst of Revelation chapter 6, you can find the beginning and the the. the just prior to the beginning, and then the beginning of the Great Tribulation period. I'll, start, I'll try to show you that in the next 15 minutes where that is. But let me read you a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus speaking. And many feel as though this is, well, he says it's the beginning of sorrows. Let me read this. And he sat on Mount Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when all these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, Antichrist. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they will lead many away. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must, must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be fam famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains, or in your translation may say the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. He says that's not the end yet. Now some think that's not the end of 
um, the tribulation period. Some think that's not the end of human history as we're now living in it, just prior to the rapture. We don't really know. I'm taking it as just being prior to the rapture, prior to the beginning of the great tribulation period. So now we, we pick up in Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what it seems to be the voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, Look at a quart of wheat for a denarius. That's about one day's pay wage. It's about 15 cents. And they would work a day for a denarius. So he's saying here that a quart of wheat, you're, you're going to get a day's food for a day's work. That's basically what they're pointing at, what's going to, what it's going to be like to be alive on planet Earth during this time. And three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. For, for when he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And its rider was death. And Hades followed him. And they were given authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence, and this is interesting, and with by wild beasts of the earth. We're not talking about something thousands of years ago. We're talking about something in front of us, not behind us here. So the first horse, the black one, covered all food sources and, distribu and distributing the fo food. In other words, the picture here is the people on earth at this time are just surviving. It's like the Great Depression all over again. They're just working enough to feed their families and to eat themselves, and, and to eat themselves, to eat at days, don't know, that's, that's later on, to eat themselves. <laughs> and, um, but they, they just, um, they're just working just enough to get by. So you can, you can sort of feel the desperation which the author is bringing out here, John's bringing out. The next horse is the pale horse, and this is one that boggles the mind. It's responsible um, at this rate for over a billion people to die. Now, this could come post-tribulation, in the, in the tribulation, or this could come before the tribulation. We're not really positive, but think of a billion people dying in a short period of time and the ramifications of what that would be on the planet Earth. Imagine taking the church of Jesus Christ off the face of the earth and one grand swipe called the rapture, and then you take shortly thereafter, the next two to three years, a billion people die, or maybe even before the tribulation, another billion people die. John Volvoord, in his commentary on Revelation that he wrote in 1966, said that'd be equivalent of all of Europe and South America dying. All of Europe and South America gone. So this horse has war, disease, famine, wild beast. What do you even do with that many dead bodies? How do you even begin to fathom what life would be like on the planet Earth? Now that I get you all hopeful. <laughs> This is hard verses. I mean, you teach these things, and you say, okay, what can I say to make them feel good? Because after this, they're going to be like, oh, my God, this is just horrible. And, and um, well, I have something to hopefully make you feel good at the end. I'll tell you what it is now. You won't be here. <laughs> but but we, we have loved ones that we know that they could be here. So we want to be, we want to take this serious. This will be the greatest loss of life in human history that we'll see at this time. Then I saw, verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So the vision went from this movie being played out, went from planet Earth back up to heaven. The fifth seal opens. Now they're looking back at the throne of God. John, John is watching and looking at the throne of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood? on those who dwell on the earth. And they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until a number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they 
themselves were. Now, some feel this is the start of the Great Tribulation. Some think it already started with the pale horse. Some think this is the halfway point of the Tribulation period. Some think the Tribulation period starts in Revelation chapter 11. Um, you can figure that out yourself. We know that it starts. And we know that the planet Earth prior to it starting and the planet Earth after it starting is going to be um, a very, very hostile, arduous, difficult place for humanity to live. Um, and again, this sort of parallels if you go further in Matthew chapter 24 and you go to chapter verse 15, remember we talked about the beginning of sorrows? Let's pick up Matthew 24 again. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, that's in Daniel chapter 7, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. That's the, de that's the destruction and the desecration of the temple. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop go down and take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back and take his cloak. And alas, the women who are pregnant, for, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as it has not been from the beginning of the world until now and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut, cut short. So I want to bring out a few things here, and I hope this blesses you because it really blessed me when I studied this a few years ago. This is just one portion of what I studied when we talked about heaven for, um, back, back again right after we lost our daughter. The martyred saints... Um, in Revelation chapter 6, when you look at this objectively, they were aware of where they just came from, right? They said they just came from planet Earth. And they were aware that their brethren, and the word brethren there is El Delphos, and it means from the same womb, very likely blood brethren, their brethren, their family was still on planet Earth. So they were aware, and they're, going to, they're actually beseeching the Lord in heaven, how long before you avenge our deaths? We got loved ones down there, if I can paraphrase this. We have loved ones down there in this, in this hellhole called earth right now. How long, God, before you avenge our death? And so they were aware, there's an awareness of the saints in heaven of what was still going on on earth. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, Murdoch translation, therefore let us also who have these witnesses surrounding us like clouds cast from us all encumbrance and sin which is always prepared for us and let us run with patience the race that is appointed for us. So in that verse, I just want to bring up a little bit on that verse because that crowd of witnesses in this translation um, it really refers back to, to a point of Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, you have the, you have the heroes of the faith. The, they mention all the great men of faith. And then you start Hebrews chapter 12. He says, therefore, looking back, therefore, in light of chapter 11, therefore, that's always a look back, therefore, in light of chapter 11, let us, we, um, let us also have these witnesses surrounding us like clouds. Now, who are those witnesses? Well, there are two views, and they really sort of, I think, fit together pretty well. I believe those witnesses are the people who have gone on before us. I believe, the, I believe those witnesses are your mom and your dad and your loved ones that maybe not doesn't have a running, moving picture of what you're going through here now on earth, but they, there's an awareness. There's an awareness of the times. I think there's an awareness of even maybe their family on earth. It seems to point to this. Of course, this brings great comfort to me. But I think it brings great comfort to anyone who's lost anyone that's lost somebody close. Because there isn't necessarily this great, call, this great gulf between heaven and earth. Randy Alcorn said this, Earth may be ignorant of heaven, but heaven is not ignorant of earth. After his book on heaven that he wrote. Yeah, I don't think we know really what's happening up there, but I'm not quite sure they're as ignorant as we are of what's happening down here. Again, I don't know how that is. I don't think there's running commentary on each of our lives. Probably not that. But I think those who have gone on before us that we love, that maybe carry our name, they have at least an understanding of the race we're still running 
and they're cheering us on according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. They're cheering us on in this life of faith. Now, these saints in heaven appear to have physical bodies. We know that the final resurrection isn't until the second coming of Christ. That's when we get our, our bodies back from the grave. But when you look at these saints, these are these pre-resurrected bodies of some sort, but they put a robe on. If you're just a spirit, could you put a robe on? The robe would fall right off, wouldn't it? Oh, oh I'm, just, uh, I'm just a spirit. I couldn't wear clothes. I need a body to wear clothes. And so, so there's some type of a body here. It, it's not the body that we're going to have for all eternity, but there's some type of, a, if I could use this term, a spiritual slash physical body that the saints who have gone on now in this present heaven, and we'll talk more about heaven as the series goes on because it refers back to it numerous times, that them, they, um, they, 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 they are dressed in this robe. So they're going to have a recognizable presence is what I'm getting at. They're not just going to be a ghost. They're going to be a recognizable presence in heaven. They ask God a question. In other, in other words, they didn't have all knowledge, and they were still learning in heaven. They were still, hey, God, how long? I want to know this. I have a question. In heaven, with my glorified body, whatever that means, that new body I have, I have a question. And, and still, the, the present heaven, that's where folks are at now that have passed away, coexists while planet Earth is still really under the, the curse. They are aware of the passing of time. How much longer? I didn't think it would be any time. They just asked, how much longer? They were aware that there was time in this present heaven where they're at. It's just a few verses, but you can glean a lot of information from them if you look and you think and you meditate. It's quite an amazing passage. Let me, let me wind this down here because I like to spend more time on that. I like that subject of heaven. In verse 12, it says this, And he opened up the sixth seal, and I looked. Behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and the full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit and is shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll and is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and uh, the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in caves and among the rocks and the mountains. Money's not going to buy you out of this. Calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who's, who can stand? Now, whose wrath was it? The Lamb. You can say it's demonic, and it was manifested, but this was God's wrath on planet Earth, the wrath of the Lamb. And I don't want to leave you there because this is, um, we know in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, it says, God has not destined us for what? Wrath. Who's us? You, the church, the body of Christ, God's bride, the Lamb of God, the, 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 I'm sorry, the, the bride of the Lamb of God. You, you're not you're not destined for wrath. You say you're not appointed to wrath. Wrath is a, a word, orge, and it's, it's God's wrath, God's wrath on human earth, on earth, but it's not for those of his, of his bride. It's for those who are left behind who have rejected him, this side of eternity, this side of life. Now, this description that we see here is valid. You look at other prophecies in the scriptures, and Joel 2.2, Joel 2.10, um, oh, I forget all the different verses, Isaiah 34.4, some of the different verses. You look at the different verses, and they'll describe what we just read here in the last few verses of Revelation. But understanding all that, for the great day of wrath has come, who can stand? Well, nobody that is left behind. Nobody in a human body that has missed the rapture of the church, which is for anyone who simply receives it. But for God's children, you and I, and everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ, he says, we are not appointed to wrath. Some people will disagree with that, and I'll disagree with you. <laughs> 
because I just believe when Jesus Christ died on the cross and he made me his son, his adopted son, when he called me his bride and entered into a, a marital relationship with me as his bride, that my father would not put his son in the way of his wrath. A husband would not take his bride and put him in the path of his wrath. That doesn't, a human wouldn't do that. Never mind a God of love, First John 4 a. So this is horrible, what's coming. Uh, we will witness this from some degree. We'll witness at least what's going on in heaven and we'll be aware of what's going on on earth because we'll be part of that great cloud of witnesses that we saw in chapter five. We'll be part of that, in fact, chapter four. We'll be part of that great cloud of witnesses, but we won't be here for this. And God forbid that we have loved ones that are here and that's why we want to pray five minutes a day for the next three months. We want to pray for our loved ones. We want to pray for that person who lives next to me that I've never been able to crack the code on getting to talk to them. On that person who lives across the street from my church, the person in the cubicle in my office building, whoever that may be, those people that our life intersects with, we pray, God, give me the opportunity to share with them this hope that I have. I don't know how long it'll be before the Lord comes back, and neither do you. You can turn on many TV shows, they'll tell you it's right here. And they've been saying that for a long time. It could be right here. Sort of smells like it's right around the corner, doesn't it? Does, can you see the world going on much longer the way that it goes on as it is? I, you can't. But we could be here, this world could be here as it is for another thousand years. We just do not know. So in the meantime, we roll up our sleeves and we become representatives of God's kingdom and we pray for the loss and we have, a, we have a vision and a purpose to see more people come to Christ and to have this hope that they have. We make our church a place of love and acceptance where people can come and just go, 